what's Daddy doing? He's no, no, fireworks! Fireworks and Brisha! what happened on uh, November the 5th. Yeah, so uh, originally we were planning to go to our local pub um, for an organised display and uh, on the day uh, Scarlett, our middle child, wasn't very well and I said to my husband, you know, it's not worth dragging them all out and, you know, we'll just have some hot dogs and a bonfire at home and, you know, they'll be fine. They were five-ish and we went out and I said, we'll do the fireworks first and then after the fireworks we can, you know, the kids can have hot dogs and stuff. And they were, you know, they were these tiny, they were silent fireworks because of the sheep and the horses and stuff. Um, five flares went up, one, two, three, four, bang, well not bang, but they exploded into pink in the air. And then there was like a pause and I, I remember my mum saying, is that it? And with that, it was almost as if a firework exploded in the ground and the fifth flare just shot horizontally across the field. And... Um, everybody started screaming and because I was stood a little bit back away from my mum and the kids I didn't realise at first what had happened and mm. it wasn't until I saw the flames that I realised that it had got caught in Maisie's scarf and then exploded um, and her scarf had caught fire and I, I was screaming, the kids were screaming. My husband is a very um, practical man and he had a bucket of water next to the fireworks anyway in case any of them didn't go off and he just ran and he threw the water over her. Um, and it's like you see on the telly sometimes, but everything's happening around you and it goes silent. And I was just, you know, I was just screaming. And I felt like the worst parent in the world ringing mm. an ambulance on bonfire night because my child had been burnt. And I was on the phone and the lady, the, she was the operator that answered. She was absolutely wonderful. She was like, you know, what's happened? Tell me. And I remember Scarlett was upstairs and I could, and she was screaming, just screaming and screaming and screaming. And the lady said to me, is that her screaming? That's a good sign if she's screaming. And I said, no, that's her sister. She, you know, she's deadly quiet. And she said, no, well, uh, I've got the ambulance is on its way, the ambulance is on its way. And, and they weren't, I th you know, I don't know, probably less than 10 minutes, the paramedics were there. And uh, they came in and oh, they were amazing. They, they looked at her and they gave her morphine. Um, because by then she started to kind of come round a bit and she, you know, she was starting to cry because it was obviously hurting. And they, again, they looked at her and they said, oh, we need to go into hospital. And when we got into A&E, the doctor was trying to look at her and she, you know, uh, she started to then get really terrified of people touching anything near. And I remember them taking her clothes off and that was the first time I'd seen it. And I don't, I don't you know, when you burn yourself, when you first do it, it you know it doesn't look that bad it's quite it was very light it was very, you know it was almost white and pink and I remember looking at it and thinking that doesn't look that bad and the consultant looked at her and he said to me this is serious you know some of these are full thickness she needs to go to Bristol and I remember thinking then this is you know <laughs> this is bad and uh and so we put her in the car and I held her on my lap and you know, she was wrapped in bandages and they'd given her more morphine and Jake drove us up to Bristol Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, she had the discharge letter from Barnstable, she went straight through A&E um, and went into the specialist burns unit that they, it's, um, it's attached to the high dependency unit and I think there are four beds. And I remember her lying on the trolley in this, you know, they call it the assessment room and it's just machines everywhere. And she was lying on the trolley and they'd stripped her completely naked to have a look at her. And she just looked so tiny and so terrified. And mm. <laughs> and they, they said, we're not going to do anything tonight. I said, but she'll need to go into the theatre tomorrow. Um, so they, you know, they gave her more morphine. And she went into what would become her room for the next, you know, 10 days. And, and the nurses came in every hour to check on her, to check her temperature. Check on her, and it wasn't until the next day when it became apparent that um, the burns, you know, the burns were never going to kill her, but if she got an infection, that was, that could have been an entirely different story. So they said to us, they said, we need to properly assess her burns, which means putting her in the bath and washing them. And I remember the, uh, the nurse that was in charge saying to me that this is not going to be nice. She is going to scream mm -hmm. and you don't have to be there, but 
the, you know, there was absolutely no way that me and Jake were going to leave her. So we went in with her and the two nurses were trying, they were holding her and they were, they were trying to wash them. And I've never ever in my life heard a child scream in pain like that. And I was mm. stood by the door and I was adamant that I wasn't walking out that door. I was going to stay. And she was, you know, I mean, she's four and she's not, she's, she's quite small anyway. And she was struggling so much that in the end, Jake had to hold her down so that they could do it. And she screamed and she screamed and she screamed. And then they redressed her and she went back into her bedroom. And I remember the nurse saying to me, we are going to have to do that every day. And the surgeon came around to have a look at her and he said, I don't want to do anything yet. I don't, I want to, I want to wait and give her a few days to see what the body does itself before before we take her into theatre. Unfortunately, later on that day, she developed a very high temperature. And that night, she, you know, her temperature was, it was going up, it was going to spiking, going down again, spiking, going down again. And I think it must have been about half four, five o'clock, the nurse came in and took her temperature and she said, we need to get a doctor here. Um, and the doctor came in and he said, we need to take, we'll take blood and we'll, uh, We'll, do, we'll run some, you know, we'll run some quick tests. But before they could even get the results back, her temperature went through the roof, and her consultant said, "We need to go into theatre, um, and we need to cut these burns out, in, you know, in case she's got an infection." The so, next few days, a kind of a blur. She, you know, for a week she was in, in and out of theatre, having her burns scrubbed. Um, but it became apparent very quickly that the whole bath situation was not going to work because it was so painful, even with you know all the pain medication. So they were taking her into theatre because it was, you know, it was in her best interests. And I think over seven days she went in for five five different operations. Got to the Friday and she was supposed to be she was supposed to be reviewed on the Monday. Um, but it was my dad's funeral on the Saturday. Um, and so I, I you know I said to the doctors, I said, I have to, you know, I have to go, Jake has to go. My mother-in-law was coming down to stay with her. And it it was a horrific, awful situation. You know, I couldn't not go to dad's funeral, but leaving your four-year-old child in, you know, in hospital is, is every, you know, every mother's not worst nightmare, really. Um, and then I remember the consultant coming back a couple of hours later and he said to me, he said, if you promise that you wrap her in cotton wool, he said, I will temporarily discharge her for the weekend. So we brought her home and, you know, obviously the entire family are here because it was the funeral. And, and it, you know, it was lovely having her home, um, but it did get to the, you know, Sunday when we had to take her back. And when she was booked back into hospital, it was a bit like, you know, we're, it's not, you know, it's not my job to keep her safe right now. It's, yeah, it's up to them again. And on Monday, and they said, we need to give her a skin graft. Mm. Um, and they, you know, they would take it from her right leg. She came out of theatre that day. She, um, she was just hysterical. My leg, my leg, my leg, my leg. Oh. Oh. It was just, it was, you know, we'd kind of gone back. We, we, it felt like we'd taken two steps back. And when they, re, when they checked it for the second time, um, I remember him saying to me, the grafts haven't taken, we'll have to take the other side of the leg as well. And, you know, your heart sinks. And you think, oh, God, you know, God, how many times do we have to go back to that place where she's in so much pain? And thankfully, um, the second lot of grafts took, and then they did have to take a third graft, but that was only to patch up the bit under her chin. Um, and eventually, I think it was about two weeks, she was properly discharged. And then for the next two weeks, every two days, a team of nurses would come round, and we would have to hold her in the bath while they cleaned, cleaned all her burns, and uh, she would scream, and she would scream, and she would scream. And Jake used to have to come home from work just to hold her. I think it was about six weeks, six weeks after it happened, her bandages came off and she was, you know, she wasn't allowed back to, she wasn't allowed back at school. She didn't go back to school until January, but she was, you know, she was bandage free and everything had started to scab over and, it, you know, it was kind of, we were getting back to normal. And now once a month she goes to Bristol and she's reviewed by the consultant. Um, and as it is at the moment, they're quite happy with how everything's healing. Uh, she's got some raised bits on her shoulder where the body's kind of overhealing. But they've said that, you know, two years, two years that they leave them so the body can heal itself before they look into any kind of laser, okay. laser therapy, etc. I think 
if there's any message to come out of what's happened to Maisie is that even if you are following the you know following the guidelines completely things can go wrong things can go so terribly wrong and what happened to Maisie was a horrific accident mm. but she suffered so much and you know she is going to be scarred for life and it is never ever worth that risk mm -hmm. when you can go to a professional display and watch these beautiful fireworks and be completely safe mm -hmm. um, I would just say don't don't risk it don't do it in your own garden.